These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is, Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had seventy descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pitham and Ramesses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him, if it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live, too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? he demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River. But you may let the girls live. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, 
his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, Who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, Everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation, and he settled there with him. In time, Ruel gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses. Moses. Here I am. Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look! 
The cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you, this is my eternal name. My name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him, F. 20 So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. But Moses protested again, What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, The Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, Reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, If they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. 
Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please. Send anyone else. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said. What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look. He is on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him, and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you, and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, Return to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you have died. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand he carried the staff of God. And the Lord told Moses, When you arrive back in Egypt, Go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. I commanded you, Let my son go, so he can worship me. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said, A bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now the Lord had said to Aaron, Go out into the wilderness to meet Moses. So Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God, and he embraced him. Moses then told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say. And he told him about the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses, and Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with the sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land, and you are stopping them from their work. That same day Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. 
Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves. But still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they are crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. So the slave drivers and foremen went out and told the people, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not provide any more straw for you. Go and get it yourselves. Find it wherever you can. But you must produce just as many bricks as before. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt in search of stubble to use as straw. Meanwhile, the Egyptian slave drivers continued to push hard. Meet your daily quota of bricks, just as you did when we provided you with straw, they demanded. Then they whipped the Israelite foreman they had put in charge of the work crews. Why haven't you met your quotas either yesterday or today, they demanded. So the Israelite foreman went to Pharaoh and pleaded with him. Please don't treat your servants like this, they begged. We are given no straw, but the slave drivers still demand, make bricks. We are being beaten, but it isn't our fault. Your own people are to blame. But Pharaoh shouted, you're just lazy. Lazy. That's why you're saying, let us go and offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still produce the full quota of bricks. The Israelite foremen could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told, you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who were waiting outside for them. The foreman said to them, May the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword into their hands, an excuse to kill us. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people. And you have done nothing to rescue them. Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name, Yahweh, to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan, where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel, who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But Lord! Moses objected. My own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm such a clumsy speaker. 
But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them orders for the Israelites and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. These are the ancestors of some of the clans of Israel, the sons of Reuben, Israel's oldest son, were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. Their descendants became the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shal. Shal's mother was a Canaanite woman. Their descendants became the clans of Simeon. These are the descendants of Levi, as listed in their family records, the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived to be 137 years old. The descendants of Gershon included Libni and Shimi, each of whom became the ancestor of a clan. The descendants of Kohath included Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Uzziel. Kohath lived to be 133 years old. The descendants of Merari included Mali and Mushi, these are the clans of the Levites, as listed in their family records. Umram married his father's sister Yaqabed, and she gave birth to his sons, Aaron and Moses. Umram lived to be 137 years old. The sons of Azar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uzziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Amminadab and sister of Nashon, and she gave birth to his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Asur, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. Their descendants became the clans of Korah. Eleazar son of Aaron married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she gave birth to his son, Phinehas, these are the ancestors of the Levite families, listed according to their clans. The Aaron and Moses named in this list are the same ones to whom the Lord said, Lead the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. It was Moses and Aaron who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, about leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. When the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, everything I am telling you. But Moses argued with the Lord, saying, I can't do it. I'm such a clumsy speaker. Why should Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, Pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother, Aaron, will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses was eighty years old, and Aaron was eighty-three when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, Show me a miracle. When he does this, say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, 
just as the Lord had predicted. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, b, and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river. Stand on the bank of the Nile and meet him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake. Then announce to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, Let my people go, so they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen to him. So this is what the Lord says, I will show you that I am the Lord. Look! I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink any water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers, canals, ponds, and all the reservoirs. Turn all the water to blood. Everywhere in Egypt the water will turn to blood, even the water stored in wooden bowls and stone pots. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. As Pharaoh and all of his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. Suddenly, the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. But again the magicians of Egypt used their magic, and they, too, turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had predicted. Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. Then all the Egyptians dug along the riverbank to find drinking water, for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. Seven days passed from the time the Lord struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Frogs will jump on you, your people, and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, and ponds of Egypt, and bring up frogs over all the land. So Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the whole land. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. They, too, caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, Plead with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go, so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. You set the time. Moses replied. Tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials, and your people. Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile River. Do it tomorrow. Pharaoh said, All right, Moses replied, It will be as you have said. Then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile River. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace, and Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had inflicted on Pharaoh. And the Lord did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields all died. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps, and a terrible stench filled the land. But when Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, 
just as the Lord had predicted. So the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Raise your staff and strike the ground. The dust will turn into swarms of gnats throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. When Aaron raised his hand and struck the ground with his staff, gnats infested the entire land, covering the Egyptians and their animals. All the dust in the land of Egypt turned into gnats. Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their secret arts, but this time they failed. And the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike. This is the finger of God, the magicians exclaimed to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them, just as the Lord had predicted. Then the Lord told Moses, Get up early in the morning and stand in Pharaoh's way as he goes down to the river. Say to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go, so they can worship me. If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, and all the houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies, and the ground will be covered with them. But this time I will spare the region of Goshen, where my people live. No flies will be found there. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that I am present even in the heart of your land. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. And the Lord did just as he had said. A thick swarm of flies filled Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his officials. The whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos by the flies. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron. All right. Go ahead and offer sacrifices to your God, he said. But do it here in this land. But Moses replied, that wouldn't be right. The Egyptians detest the sacrifices that we offer to the Lord our God. Look, if we offer our sacrifices here where the Egyptians can see us, they will stone us. We must take a three-day trip into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, just as he has commanded us. All right, go ahead, Pharaoh replied. I will let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God. But don't go too far away. Now hurry and pray for me. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear from you and your officials and all your people. But I am warning you, Pharaoh, don't lie to us again and refuse to let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses left Pharaoh's palace and pleaded with the Lord to remove all the flies. And the Lord did as Moses asked and caused the swarms of flies to disappear from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. Not a single fly remained. But Pharaoh again became stubborn and refused to let the people go. Go back to Pharaoh, the Lord commanded Moses. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so they can worship me. If you continue to hold them and refuse to let them go, the hand of the Lord will strike all your livestock, your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats, with a deadly plague. But the Lord will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and that of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Israel's animals will die. The Lord has already set the time for the plague to begin. He has declared that he will strike the land tomorrow. And the Lord did just as he had said. The next morning all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but the Israelites didn't lose a single animal. Pharaoh sent his officials to investigate and they discovered that the Israelites had not lost a single animal. But even so, Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn, and he still refused to let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from a brick kiln, 
and have Moses toss it into the air while Pharaoh watches. The ashes will spread like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering boils to break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a brick kiln and went and stood before Pharaoh. As Pharaoh watched, Moses threw the soot into the air, and boils broke out on people and animals alike. Even the magicians were unable to stand before Moses, because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and just as the Lord had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh refused to listen. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I have spared you for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. But you still lord it over my people and refuse to let them go. So tomorrow at this time I will send a hailstorm more devastating than any in all the history of Egypt. Quick! Order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter. Any person or animal left outside will die when the hail falls. Some of Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what the Lord had said. They quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the word of the Lord left theirs out in the open. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward the sky so hail may fall on the people, the livestock, and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and lightning flashed toward the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstorm against all the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that, with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field, people, animals, and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he confessed. The Lord is the righteous one, and my people and I are wrong. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go, you don't need to stay any longer. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail will stop, and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. All the flax and barley were ruined by the hail, because the barley had formed heads and the flax was budding. But the wheat and the emmer wheat were spared, because they had not yet sprouted from the ground. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. When he lifted his hands to the Lord, the thunder and hail stopped, and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again, and Pharaoh again became stubborn. Because his heart was hard, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, just as the Lord had predicted through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn so I can display my miraculous signs among them. I've also done it so you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them, and so you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, How long will you refuse to submit to me? 
Let my people go, so they can worship me. If you refuse, watch out. For tomorrow I will bring a swarm of locusts on your country. They will cover the land so that you won't be able to see the ground. They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the fields. They will overrun your palaces and the homes of your officials and all the houses in Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one. And with that, Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials now came to Pharaoh and appealed to him. How long will you let this man hold us hostage? Let the men go to worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. All right, he told them, go and worship the Lord your God. But who exactly will be going with you? Moses replied, we will all go, young and old, our sons and daughters, and our flocks and herds. We must all join together in celebrating a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh retorted, The Lord will certainly need to be with you if I let you take your little ones. I can see through your evil plan. Never. Only the men may go and worship the Lord, since that is what you requested. And Pharaoh threw them out of the palace. Then the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt, and the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locusts. And the locusts swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history, and there has never been another one like it. For the locusts covered the whole country and darkened the land. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sin, just this once, and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind, and the strong west wind blew the locusts into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time the people could not see each other, and no one moved. But there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses. Go and worship the Lord, he said. But leave your flocks and herds here. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us, too, not a hoof can be left behind. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals. And we won't know how we are to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more, and he would not let them go. Get out of here. Pharaoh shouted at Moses. I'm warning you. Never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied. I will never see your face again. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh and the land of Egypt with one more blow. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now the Lord had caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the people of Israel. 
And Moses was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, At midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. All the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave, they will beg. Hurry! And take all your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then, burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Now the Lord had told Moses earlier, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed these miracles in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he wouldn't let the Israelites leave the country. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the fourteenth day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember. Each year, from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, Remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. On the first day of the festival and again on the seventh day, all the people must observe an official day for holy assembly. 
No work of any kind may be done on these days except in the preparation of food. Celebrate this festival of unleavened bread, for it will remind you that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very day. This festival will be a permanent law for you, celebrate this day from generation to generation. The bread you eat must be made without yeast from the evening of the fourteenth day of the first month until the evening of the twenty-first day of that month. During those seven days, there must be no trace of yeast in your homes. Anyone who eats anything made with yeast during this week will be cut off from the community of Israel. These regulations apply both to the foreigners living among you and to the native-born Israelites. During those days you must not eat anything made with yeast. Wherever you live, eat only bread made without yeast. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go, pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families, and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. Then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses. And no one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Remember, these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, What does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshipped. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people, and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds, as you said, and be gone. Go, but bless me as you leave. All the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible, for they thought, we will all die. The Israelites took their bread dough before yeast was added. They wrapped their kneading boards in their cloaks and carried them on their shoulders. And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed, they asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites, and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. That night the people of Israel left Ramesses and started for Sukkot. There were about 600,000 men, plus all the women and children. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them, along with great flocks and herds of livestock. For bread they baked flat cakes from the dough without yeast they had brought from Egypt. 
It was made without yeast because the people were driven out of Egypt in such a hurry that they had no time to prepare the bread or other food. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces left the land. On this night the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites, from generation to generation. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, These are the instructions for the festival of Passover. No outsiders are allowed to eat the Passover meal. But any slave who has been purchased may eat it if he has been circumcised. Temporary residents and hired servants may not eat it. Each Passover lamb must be eaten in one house. Do not carry any of its meat outside, and do not break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate this Passover festival. If there are foreigners living among you who want to celebrate the Lord's Passover, let all their males be circumcised. Only then may they celebrate the Passover with you like any native-born Israelite. But no uncircumcised male may ever eat the Passover meal. This instruction applies to everyone, whether a native-born Israelite or a foreigner living among you. So all the people of Israel followed all the Lord's commands to Moses and Aaron. On that very day the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. Then the Lord said to Moses, Dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites. The first offspring to be born, of both humans and animals, belongs to me. So Moses said to the people, This is a day to remember forever, the day you left Egypt, the place of your slavery. Today the Lord has brought you out by the power of his mighty hand. Remember, eat no food containing yeast. On this day in early spring, in the month of Abib, you have been set free. You must celebrate this event in this month each year after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites. He swore to your ancestors that he would give you this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast. Then on the seventh day, celebrate a feast to the Lord. Eat bread without yeast during those seven days. In fact, there must be no yeast bread or any yeast at all found within the borders of your land during this time. On the seventh day you must explain to your children, I am celebrating what the Lord did for me when I left Egypt. This annual festival will be a visible sign to you, like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead. Let it remind you always to recite this teaching of the Lord, with a strong hand, the Lord rescued you from Egypt. So observe the decree of this festival at the appointed time each year. This is what you must do when the Lord fulfills the promise He swore to you and to your ancestors. When He gives you the land where the Canaanites now live, twelve you must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. Thirteen a firstborn donkey may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. And in the future, your children will ask you, what does all this mean? Then you will tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, so the Lord killed all the firstborn males throughout the land of Egypt, both people and animals. That is why I now sacrifice all the firstborn males to the Lord, 
except that the firstborn sons are always bought back. This ceremony will be like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead. It is a reminder that the power of the Lord's mighty hand brought us out of Egypt. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear to do this. He said, God will certainly come to help you. When he does, you must take my bones with you from this place. The Israelites left Sukkot and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Pihahirath between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal-Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done, letting all those Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him six hundred of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel, who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers, and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pihahirath, across from Baal-Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked and they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots, and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. 
The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on each side. Then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. Then the waters returned and covered all the chariots and charioteers, the entire army of Pharaoh. Of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and army. He has hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters gushed over them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those who rise against you. You unleash your blazing fury. It consumes them like straw. At the blast of your breath, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood straight like a wall. In the heart of the sea the deep waters became hard. The enemy boasted, I will chase them. And catch up with them. I will plunder them. And consume them. I will flash my sword. My powerful hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath. And the sea covered them. They sank like lead. In the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Glorious in holiness. Awesome in splendor. Performing great wonders. You raised your right hand. And the earth swallowed our enemies. With your unfailing love you lead the people you have redeemed. In your might, you guide them to your sacred home. 
the peoples hear and tremble. Anguish grips those who live in Philistia. The leaders of Edom are terrified. The nobles of Moab tremble. All who live in Canaan melt away. Terror and dread fall upon them. The power of your arm makes them lifeless as stone. Until your people pass by, O Lord. Until the people you purchased pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, reserved for your own dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers rushed into the sea, the Lord brought the water crashing down on them. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine and led all the women as they played their tambourines and danced. And Miriam sang this song, Sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Mara, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink that it was there at Mara that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. After leaving Mara, the Israelites traveled on to the oasis of Elim, where they found twelve springs and seventy palm trees. They camped there beside the water. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elim and journeyed into the wilderness of Sin, between Elim and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the fifteenth day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they will gather food, and when they prepare it, there will be twice as much as usual. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaints, which are against him, not against us. What have we done that you should complain about us? Then Moses added, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning, for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, Announce this to the entire community of Israel, Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you will have meat to eat, and in the morning you will have all the bread you want. 
then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning the area around the camp was wet with dew. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? they asked each other. They had no idea what it was, and Moses told them, It is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions, each household should gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, Do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Moses was very angry with them. After this the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its need. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, for quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today, and set aside what is left for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded. And in the morning the leftover food was wholesome and good, without maggots or odor. Moses said, Eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. The Lord asked Moses, How long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day, so there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. The Israelites called the food manna that I tea was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like honey wafers. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded, fill a two-quart container with manna to preserve it for your descendants. Then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set you free from Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, get a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna. Then put it in a sacred place before the Lord to preserve it for all future generations. Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He eventually placed it in the Ark of the Covenant, in front of the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. So the people of Israel ate manna for forty years until they arrived at the land where they would settle. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. The container used to measure the manna was an omer, which was one-tenth of an ephah, it held about two quarts. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. Eventually they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded, quiet. Moses replied, Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? 
but tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massa, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord here with us or not? While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, Choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and her climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and her found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. After the victory, the Lord instructed Moses, Write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder, and read it aloud to Joshua, I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar there and named it Yawinisi, which means, The Lord is my banner. He said, They have raised their fist against the Lord's throne, so now the Lord will be at war with Amalek generation after generation. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, heard about everything God had done for Moses and his people, the Israelites. He heard especially about how the Lord had rescued them from Egypt. Earlier, Moses had sent his wife, Zipporah, and his two sons back to Jethro, who had taken them in. Moses' first son was named Gershom, for Moses had said when the boy was born, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. His second son was named Eliezer, for Moses had said, The God of my ancestors was my helper, he rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, now came to visit Moses in the wilderness. He brought Moses' wife and two sons with him, and they arrived while Moses and the people were camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent a message to Moses, saying, Jethro, your father-in-law, am coming to see you with your wife and your two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed low and kissed him. They asked about each other's welfare and then went into Moses' tent. Moses told his father-in-law everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh in Egypt on behalf of Israel. He also told about all the hardships they had experienced along the way and how the Lord had rescued his people from all their troubles. Jethro was delighted when he heard about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel as he rescued them from the hand of the Egyptians. Praise the Lord, Jethro said, for he has rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh. Yes, he has rescued Israel from the powerful hand of Egypt. I know now that the Lord is greater than all other gods, because he rescued his people from the oppression of the proud Egyptians. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. 
Aaron and all the elders of Israel came out and joined him in a sacrificial meal in God's presence. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, What are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses replied, Because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me, and I am the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. This is not good. Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out, and the people, too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to Him. Teach them God's decrees, and give them His instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in peace. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestions. He chose capable men from all over Israel and appointed them as leaders over the people. He put them in charge of groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. These men were always available to solve the people's common disputes. They brought the major cases to Moses, but they took care of the smaller matters themselves. Soon after this, Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law, who returned to his own land. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob, announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Then the Lord told Moses, Go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow, and have them wash their clothing. Be sure they are ready on the third day, for on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people, be careful. Do not go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary, instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. 
they must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship, and they washed their clothes. He told them, Get ready for the third day, and until then abstain from having sexual intercourse. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Then the Lord told Moses, Go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord, or they will die. Even the priests who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. But the Lord said, Go down and bring Aaron back up with you. In the meantime, do not let the priests or the people break through to approach the Lord, or he will break out and destroy them. So Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us, or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you, and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, You saw for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. Remember, 
you must not make any idols of silver or gold to rival me. Build for me an altar made of earth, and offer your sacrifices to me, your burnt offerings and peace offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Build my altar wherever I cause my name to be remembered, and I will come to you and bless you. If you use stones to build my altar, use only natural, uncut stones. Do not shape the stones with a tool, for that would make the altar unfit for holy use. And do not approach my altar by going up steps. If you do, someone might look up under your clothing and see your nakedness. These are the regulations you must present to Israel. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he may serve for no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. If he was single when he became your slave, he shall leave single. But if he was married before he became a slave, then his wife must be freed with him. If his master gave him a wife while he was a slave and they had sons or daughters, then only the man will be free in the seventh year, but his wife and children will still belong to his master. But the slave may declare, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I don't want to go free. If he does this, his master must present him before God. Then his master must take him to the door or doorpost and publicly pierce his ear with an awl. After that, the slave will serve his master for life. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she will not be freed at the end of six years as the men are. If she does not satisfy her owner, he must allow her to be bought back again. But he is not allowed to sell her to foreigners, since he is the one who broke the contract with her. But if the slave's owner arranges for her to marry his son, he may no longer treat her as a slave but as a daughter. If a man who has married a slave wife takes another wife for himself, he must not neglect the rights of the first wife to food, clothing, and sexual intimacy. If he fails in any of these three obligations, she may leave as a free woman without making any payment. Anyone who assaults and kills another person must be put to death. But if it was simply an accident permitted by God, I will appoint a place of refuge where the slayer can run for safety. However, if someone deliberately kills another person, then the slayer must be dragged even from my altar and be put to death. Anyone who strikes father or mother must be put to death. Kidnappers must be put to death, whether they are caught in possession of their victims or have already sold them as slaves. Anyone who dishonors father or mother must be put to death. Now suppose two men quarrel, and one hits the other with a stone or fist, and the injured person does not die but is confined to bed. If he is later able to walk outside again, even with a crutch, the assailant will not be punished but must compensate his victim for lost wages and provide for his full recovery. If a man beats his male or female slave with a club and the slave dies as a result, the owner must be punished. But if the slave recovers within a day or two, then the owner shall not be punished, since the slave is his property. Now suppose two men are fighting, and in the process they accidentally strike a pregnant woman so she gives birth prematurely. If no further injury results, the man who struck the woman must pay the amount of compensation the woman's husband demands and the judges approve. But if there is further injury, the punishment must match the injury, a life for a life. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. A burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise. If a man hits his male or female slave in the eye and the eye is blinded, he must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And if a man knocks out the tooth of his male or female slave, he must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. If an ox gores a man or woman to death, the ox must be stoned, and its flesh may not be eaten. In such a case, however, 
the owner will not be held liable. But suppose the ox had a reputation for goring, and the owner had been informed but failed to keep it under control. If the ox then kills someone, it must be stoned, and the owner must also be put to death. However, the dead person's relatives may accept payment to compensate for the loss of life. The owner of the ox may redeem his life by paying whatever is demanded. The same regulation applies if the ox gores a boy or a girl. But if the ox gores a slave, either male or female, the animal's owner must pay the slave's owner 30 silver coins, and the ox must be stoned. Suppose someone digs or uncovers a pit and fails to cover it, and then an ox or a donkey falls into it. The owner of the pit must pay full compensation to the owner of the animal, but then he gets to keep the dead animal. If someone's ox injures a neighbor's ox and the injured ox dies, then the two owners must sell the live ox and divide the price equally between them. They must also divide the dead animal. But if the ox had a reputation for goring, yet its owner failed to keep it under control, he must pay full compensation, a live ox for the dead one, but he may keep the dead ox. If someone steals an ox or sheep and then kills or sells it, the thief must pay back five oxen for each ox stolen, and four sheep for each sheep stolen. If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. But if it happens in daylight, the one who killed the thief is guilty of murder, a thief who is caught must pay in full for everything he stole. If he cannot pay, he must be sold as a slave to pay for his theft. If someone steals an ox or a donkey or a sheep and it is found in the thief's possession, then the thief must pay double the value of the stolen animal. If an animal is grazing in a field or vineyard and the owner lets it stray into someone else's field to graze, then the animal's owner must pay compensation from the best of his own grain or grapes. If you are burning thorn bushes and the fire gets out of control and spreads into another person's field, destroying the sheaves or the uncut grain or the whole crop, the one who started the fire must pay for the lost crop. Suppose someone leaves money or goods with a neighbor for safekeeping, and they are stolen from the neighbor's house. If the thief is caught, the compensation is double the value of what was stolen. But if the thief is not caught, the neighbor must appear before God, who will determine if he stole the property. Suppose there is a dispute between two people who both claim to own a particular ox, donkey, sheep, article of clothing, or any lost property. Both parties must come before God, and the person whom God declares guilty must pay double compensation to the other. Now suppose someone leaves a donkey, ox, sheep, or any other animal with a neighbor for safekeeping, but it dies or is injured or is taken away, and no one sees what happened. The neighbor must then take an oath in the presence of the Lord. If the Lord confirms that the neighbor did not steal the property, the owner must accept the verdict, and no payment will be required. But if the animal was indeed stolen, the guilty person must pay compensation to the owner. If it was torn to pieces by a wild animal, the remains of the carcass must be shown as evidence, and no compensation will be required. If someone borrows an animal from a neighbor and it is injured or dies when the owner is absent, the person who borrowed it must pay full compensation. But if the owner was present, no compensation is required. And no compensation is required if the animal was rented, for this loss is covered by the rental fee. 
If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to anyone and has sex with her, he must pay the customary bride price and marry her. But if her father refuses to let him marry her, the man must still pay him an amount equal to the bride price of a virgin. You must not allow a sorceress to live. Anyone who has sexual relations with an animal must certainly be put to death. Anyone who sacrifices to any god other than the Lord must be destroyed. You must not mistreat or oppress foreigners in any way. Remember, you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. You must not exploit a widow or an orphan. If you exploit them in any way and they cry out to me, then I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will blaze against you, and I will kill you with the sword. Then your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people who are in need, do not charge interest as a money lender would. If you take your neighbor's cloak as security for a loan, you must return it before sunset. This coat may be the only blanket your neighbor has. How can a person sleep without it? If you do not return it and your neighbor cries out to me for help, then I will hear, for I am merciful. You must not dishonor God or curse any of your rulers. You must not hold anything back when you give me offerings from your crops and your wine, you must give me your firstborn sons. You must also give me the firstborn of your cattle, sheep, and goats. But leave the newborn animal with its mother for seven days, then give it to me on the eighth day. You must be my holy people. Therefore, do not eat any animal that has been torn up and killed by wild animals. Throw it to the dogs. You must not pass along false rumors. You must not cooperate with evil people by lying on the witness stand. You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you are called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd to twist justice. And do not slant your testimony in favor of a person just because that person is poor. If you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey that has strayed away, take it back to its owner. If you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by. Instead, stop and help. In a lawsuit, you must not deny justice to the poor. Be sure never to charge anyone falsely with evil. Never sentence an innocent or blameless person to death, for I never declare a guilty person to be innocent. Take no bribes, for a bribe makes you ignore something that you clearly see. A bribe makes even a righteous person twist the truth. You must not oppress foreigners. You know what it's like to be a foreigner, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. Plant and harvest your crops for six years. But let the land be renewed and lie uncultivated during the seventh year. Then let the poor among you harvest whatever grows on its own. Leave the rest for wild animals to eat. The same applies to your vineyards and olive groves. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working. This gives your ox and your donkey a chance to rest. It also allows your slaves and the foreigners living among you to be refreshed. Pay close attention to all my instructions. You must not call on the name of any other gods. Do not even speak their names. Each year you must celebrate three festivals in my honor. First, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in early spring, in the month of Abib, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. 
no one may appear before me without an offering. Second, celebrate the festival of harvest, when you bring me the first crops of your harvest. Finally, celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season, when you have harvested all the crops from your fields. At these three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the Sovereign, the Lord. You must not offer the blood of my sacrificial offerings together with any baked goods containing yeast. And do not leave the fat from the festival offerings until the next morning. As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God, you must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Pay close attention to him, and obey his instructions. Do not rebel against him, for he is my representative, and he will not forgive your rebellion. But if you are careful to obey him, following all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies, and I will oppose those who oppose you. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, so you may live there. And I will destroy them completely. You must not worship the gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. You must serve only the Lord your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water, and I will protect you from illness. There will be no miscarriages or infertility in your land, and I will give you long, full lives. I will send my terror ahead of you and create panic among all the people whose lands you invade. I will make all your enemies turn and run. I will send terror ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites. But I will not drive them out in a single year, because the land would become desolate and the wild animals would multiply and threaten you. I will drive them out a little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. And I will fix your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, and from the eastern wilderness to the Euphrates River. I will hand over to you the people now living in the land, and you will drive them out ahead of you. Make no treaties with them or their gods. They must not live in your land, or they will cause you to sin against me. If you serve their gods, you will be caught in the trap of idolatry. Then the Lord instructed Moses, Come up here to me, and bring along Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of Israel's elders. All of you must worship from a distance. Only Moses is allowed to come near to the Lord. The others must not come near, and none of the other people are allowed to climb up the mountain with him. Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. All the people answered with one voice, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. Then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning Moses got up and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He also set up twelve pillars, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent some of the young Israelite men to present burnt offerings and to sacrifice bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses drained half the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar. Then he took the Book of the Covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again they all responded, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it over the people, declaring, Look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these instructions. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. 
Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain. Stay there, and I will give you the tablets of stone on which I have inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out, and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, Stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and her are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I am gone, consult with them. Then Moses climbed up the mountain, and the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain forty days and forty nights. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. Here is a list of sacred offerings you may accept from them, gold, silver, and bronze blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair for cloth, tanned ram skins and fine goatskin leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones and other gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold, and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings, never remove them. When the ark is finished, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement, from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherubim from hammered gold, and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the Arkansas. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. From there I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. Then make a table of acacia wood, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold and run a gold molding around the edge. Decorate it with a 3-inch border all around, and run a gold molding along the border. Make four gold rings for the table and attach them at the four corners next to the four legs. Attach the rings near the border to hold the poles that are used to carry the table. Make these poles from acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Make special containers of pure gold for the table, bowls, ladles, pitchers, 
and jars, to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. Make a lampstand of pure, hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece, the base, center stem, lamp cups, buds, and petals. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. Each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extend from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be of one piece with the center stem, and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand, and set them so they reflect their light forward. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessories. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. Make the tabernacle from 10 curtains of finely woven linen. Decorate the curtains with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. These 10 curtains must all be exactly the same size, 42 feet long and 6 feet wide. Join five of these curtains together to make one long curtain, then join the other five into a second long curtain. Put loops of blue yarn along the edge of the last curtain in each set. The 50 loops along the edge of one curtain are to match the 50 loops along the edge of the other curtain. Then make 50 gold clasps and fasten the long curtains together with the clasps. In this way, the tabernacle will be made of one continuous piece. Make 11 curtains of goat hair cloth to serve as a tent covering for the tabernacle. These 11 curtains must all be exactly the same size, 45 feet long and 6 feet wide. Join 5 of these curtains together to make one long curtain, and join the other 6 into a second long curtain. Allow three feet of material from the second set of curtains to hang over the front of the sacred tent. Make fifty loops for one edge of each large curtain. Then make fifty bronze clasps, and fasten the loops of the long curtains with the clasps. In this way, the tent covering will be made of one continuous piece. The remaining three feet of this tent covering will be left to hang over the back of the tabernacle. Allow 18 inches of remaining material to hang down over each side, so the tabernacle is completely covered. Complete the tent covering with a protective layer of tanned ram skins and a layer of fine goatskin leather. For the framework of the tabernacle, construct frames of acacia wood. Each frame must be 15 feet high and 27 inches wide, with two pegs under each frame. Make all the frames identical. Make 20 of these frames to support the curtains on the south side of the tabernacle. Also make 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame, with the pegs fitting securely into the bases. For the north side of the tabernacle, make another 20 frames. With their 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame. Make six frames for the rear, the west side of the tabernacle. Along with two additional frames to reinforce the rear corners of the tabernacle. These corner frames will be matched at the bottom and firmly attached at the top with a single ring, forming a single corner unit. Make both of these corner units the same way. So there will be eight frames at the rear of the tabernacle, set in sixteen silver bases, two bases under each frame. Make crossbars of acacia wood to link the frames, five crossbars for the north side of the tabernacle, and five for the south side. 
Also make five crossbars for the rear of the tabernacle, which will face west. The middle crossbar, attached halfway up the frames, will run all the way from one end of the tabernacle to the other. Overlay the frames with gold, and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Overlay the crossbars with gold as well. Set up this tabernacle according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain. For the inside of the tabernacle, make a special curtain of finely woven linen. Decorate it with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. Hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to four posts of acacia wood. Overlay the posts with gold, and set them in four silver bases. Hang the inner curtain from clasps, and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Then put the Ark's cover, the place of atonement, on top of the Ark of the Covenant inside the most holy place. Place the table outside the inner curtain on the north side of the tabernacle, and place the lampstand across the room on the south side. Make another curtain for the entrance to the sacred tent. Make it of finely woven linen and embroider it with exquisite designs, using blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Craft five posts from acacia wood. Overlay them with gold, and hang the curtain from them with gold hooks. Cast five bronze bases for the posts. Using acacia wood, construct a square altar seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. Make horns for each of its four corners so that the horns and altar are all one piece. Overlay the altar with bronze. Make ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat forks, and fire pans, all of bronze. Make a bronze grating for it, and attach four bronze rings at its four corners. Install the grating halfway down the side of the altar, under the ledge. For carrying the altar, make poles from acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. Insert the poles through the rings on the two sides of the altar. The altar must be hollow, made from planks. Build it just as you were shown on the mountain. Then make the courtyard for the tabernacle, enclosed with curtains made of finely woven linen. On the south side, make the curtains 150 feet long. They will be held up by 20 posts set securely in 20 bronze bases. Hang the curtains with silver hooks and rings. Make the curtains the same on the north side, 150 feet of curtains held up by 20 posts set securely in bronze bases. Hang the curtains with silver hooks and rings. The curtains on the west end of the courtyard will be 75 feet long, supported by 10 posts set into 10 bases. The east end of the courtyard, the front, will also be 75 feet long. The courtyard entrance will be on the east end, flanked by two curtains. The curtain on the right side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. The curtain on the left side will also be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, make a curtain that is 30 feet long. Make it from finely woven linen, and decorate it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Support it with four posts, each securely set in its own base. All the posts around the courtyard must have silver rings and hooks and bronze bases. So the entire courtyard will be 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, with curtain walls seven and a half feet high, made from finely woven linen. The bases for the posts will be made of bronze. All the articles used in the rituals of the tabernacle, including all the tent pegs used to support the tabernacle and the courtyard curtains, must be made of bronze. 
Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to keep the lamps burning continually. The lampstand will stand in the tabernacle, in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron and his sons must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night. This is a permanent law for the people of Israel, and it must be observed from generation to generation. Call for your brother, Aaron, and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Set them apart from the rest of the people of Israel so they may minister to me and be my priests. Make sacred garments for Aaron that are glorious and beautiful. Instruct all the skilled craftsmen whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Have them make garments for Aaron that will distinguish him as a priest set apart for my service. These are the garments they are to make, a chest piece, an ephod, a robe, a patterned tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother, Aaron, and his sons to wear when they serve me as priests. So give them fine linen cloth, gold thread, and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. The craftsman must make the ephod of finely woven linen and skillfully embroider it with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. It will consist of two pieces, front and back, joined at the shoulders with two shoulder pieces. The decorative sash will be made of the same materials, finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Take two onyx stones, and engrave on them the names of the tribes of Israel. Six names will be on each stone, arranged in the order of the births of the original sons of Israel. Engrave these names on the two stones in the same way a jeweler engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in settings of gold filigree. Fasten the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as a reminder that Aaron represents the people of Israel. Aaron will carry these names on his shoulders as a constant reminder whenever he goes before the Lord. Make the settings of gold filigree. Then braid two cords of pure gold and attach them to the filigree settings on the shoulders of the ephod. Then, with great skill and care, make a chest piece to be worn for seeking a decision from God. Make it to match the ephod, using finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Make the chest piece of a single piece of cloth folded to form a pouch 9 inches square. Mount four rows of gemstones on it. The first row will contain a red carnelian, a pale green peridot, and an emerald. The second row will contain a turquoise, a blue lapis lazuli, and a white moonstone. The third row will contain an orange jacinth, an agate, and a purple amethyst. The fourth row will contain a blue-green beryl, an onyx, and a green jasper. All these stones will be set in gold filigree. Each stone will represent one of the twelve sons of Israel, and the name of that tribe will be engraved on it like a seal. To attach the chest piece to the ephod, make braided cords of pure gold thread. Then make two gold rings and attach them to the top corners of the chest piece. Tie the two gold cords to the two rings on the chest piece. Tie the other ends of the cords to the gold settings on the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then make two more gold rings and attach them to the inside edges of the chest piece next to the ephod. And make two more gold rings and attach them to the front of the ephod, below the shoulder pieces, just above the knot where the decorative sash is fastened to the ephod. Then attach the bottom rings of the chest piece to the rings on the ephod with blue cords. This will hold the chest piece securely to the ephod above the decorative sash. In this way, Aaron will carry the names of the tribes of Israel on the sacred chest piece over his heart when he goes into the holy place. This will be a continual reminder that he represents the people when he comes before the Lord. 
Insert the Urim and Thummim into the sacred chest piece so they will be carried over Aaron's heart when he goes into the Lord's presence. In this way, Aaron will always carry over his heart the objects used to determine the Lord's will for his people whenever he goes in before the Lord. Make the robe that is worn with the ephod from a single piece of blue cloth. With an opening for Aaron's head in the middle of it. Reinforce the opening with a woven collar so it will not tear. Make pomegranates out of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and attach them to the hem of the robe, with gold bells between them. The gold bells and pomegranates are to alternate all around the hem. Aaron will wear this robe whenever he ministers before the Lord, and the bells will tinkle as he goes in and out of the Lord's presence in the holy place. If he wears it, he will not die. Next make a medallion of pure gold, and engrave it like a seal with these words, Holy to the Lord. Attach the medallion with a blue cord to the front of Aaron's turban, where it must remain. Aaron must wear it on his forehead so he may take on himself any guilt of the people of Israel when they consecrate their sacred offerings. He must always wear it on his forehead so the Lord will accept the people. Weave Aaron's patterned tunic from fine linen cloth. Fashion the turban from this linen as well. Also make a sash, and decorate it with colorful embroidery. For Aaron's sons, make tunics, sashes, and special head coverings that are glorious and beautiful. Clothe your brother, Aaron, and his sons with these garments, and then anoint and ordain them. Consecrate them so they can serve as my priests. Also make linen undergarments for them, to be worn next to their bodies, reaching from their hips to their thighs. These must be worn whenever Aaron and his sons enter the tabernacle or approach the altar in the holy place to perform their priestly duties. Then they will not incur guilt and die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and all his descendants after him. This is the ceremony you must follow when you consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests, take a young bull and two rams with no defects. Then, using choice wheat flour and no yeast, make loaves of bread, thin cakes mixed with olive oil, and wafers spread with oil. Place them all in a single basket, and present them at the entrance of the tabernacle, along with the young bull and the two rams. Present Aaron and his sons at the entrance of the tabernacle, and wash them with water. Dress Aaron in his priestly garments, the tunic, the robe worn with the ephod, the ephod itself, and the chest piece. Then wrap the decorative sash of the ephod around him. Place the turban on his head, and fasten the sacred medallion to the turban. Then anoint him by pouring the anointing oil over his head. Next present his sons, and dress them in their tunics. Wrap the sashes around the waists of Aaron and his sons, and put their special head coverings on them. Then the right to the priesthood will be theirs by law forever. In this way, you will ordain Aaron and his sons. Bring the young bull to the entrance of the tabernacle, where Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on its head. Then slaughter the bull in the Lord's presence at the entrance of the tabernacle. Put some of its blood on the horns of the altar with your finger, and pour out the rest at the base of the altar. Take all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat around them, and burn it all on the altar. Then take the rest of the bull, including its hide, meat, and dung, and burn it outside the camp as a sin offering. Next Aaron and his sons must lay their hands on the head of one of the rams. Then slaughter the ram, and splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Cut the ram into pieces, and wash off the internal organs and the legs. Set them alongside the head and the other pieces of the body. Then burn the entire animal on the altar. This is a burnt offering to the Lord, it is a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. 
Now take the other ram, and have Aaron and his sons lay their hands on its head. Then slaughter it, and apply some of its blood to the right earlobes of Aaron and his sons. Also put it on the thumbs of their right hands and the big toes of their right feet. Splatter the rest of the blood against all sides of the altar. Then take some of the blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his sons and on their garments. In this way, they and their garments will be set apart as holy. Since this is the ram for the ordination of Aaron and his sons, take the fat of the ram, including the fat of the broad tail, the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat around them, along with the right thigh. Then take one round loaf of bread, one thin cake mixed with olive oil, and one wafer from the basket of bread without yeast that was placed in the Lord's presence. Put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons to be lifted up as a special offering to the Lord. Afterward take the various breads from their hands, and burn them on the altar along with the burnt offering. It is a pleasing aroma to the Lord, a special gift for him. Then take the breast of Aaron's ordination ram, and lift it up in the Lord's presence as a special offering to him. Then keep it as your own portion. Set aside the portions of the ordination ram that belong to Aaron and his sons. This includes the breast and the thigh that were lifted up before the Lord as a special offering. In the future, whenever the people of Israel lift up a peace offering, a portion of it must be set aside for Aaron and his descendants. This is their permanent right, and it is a sacred offering from the Israelites to the Lord. Aaron's sacred garments must be preserved for his descendants who succeed him, and they will wear them when they are anointed and ordained. The descendant who succeeds him as high priest will wear these clothes for seven days as he ministers in the tabernacle and the holy place. Take the ram used in the ordination ceremony, and boil its meat in a sacred place. Then Aaron and his sons will eat this meat, along with the bread in the basket, at the tabernacle entrance. They alone may eat the meat and bread used for their purification in the ordination ceremony. No one else may eat them, for these things are set apart and holy. If any of the ordination meat or bread remains until the morning, it must be burned. It may not be eaten, for it is holy. This is how you will ordain Aaron and his sons to their offices, just as I have commanded you. The ordination ceremony will go on for seven days. Each day you must sacrifice a young bull as a sin offering to purify them, making them right with the Lord. Afterward, cleanse the altar by purifying it, make it holy by anointing it with oil. Purify the altar, and consecrate it every day for seven days. After that, the altar will be absolutely holy, and whatever touches it will become holy. These are the sacrifices you are to offer regularly on the altar. Each day, offer two lambs that are a year old. One in the morning and the other in the evening. With one of them, offer two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure oil of pressed olives, also, offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Offer the other lamb in the evening, along with the same offerings of flour and wine as in the morning. It will be a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle entrance, there I will meet with you and speak with you. I will meet the people of Israel there, in the place made holy by my glorious presence. Yes, I will consecrate the tabernacle and the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God. And they will know that I am the Lord their God. I am the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I could live among them. 
I am the Lord their God. Then make another altar of acacia wood for burning incense. Make it 18 inches square and 36 inches high, with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar itself. Overlay the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold, and run a gold molding around the entire altar. Make two gold rings, and attach them on opposite sides of the altar below the gold molding to hold the carrying poles. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Place the incense altar just outside the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant, in front of the Ark's cover, the Place of Atonement, that covers the tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. I will meet with you there. Every morning when Aaron maintains the lamps, he must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he lights the lamps, he must again burn incense in the Lord's presence. This must be done from generation to generation. Do not offer any unholy incense on this altar, or any burnt offerings, grain offerings, or liquid offerings. Once a year Aaron must purify the altar by smearing its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people from their sin. This will be a regular, annual event from generation to generation, for this is the Lord's most holy altar. Then the Lord said to Moses, Whenever you take a census of the people of Israel, each man who is counted must pay a ransom for himself to the Lord. Then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. This payment is half a shekel, based on the sanctuary shekel, which equals twenty giras. All who have reached their twentieth birthday must give this sacred offering to the Lord. When this offering is given to the Lord to purify your lives, making you right with Him, the rich must not give more than the specified amount, and the poor must not give less. Receive this ransom money from the Israelites, and use it for the care of the tabernacle. It will bring the Israelites to the Lord's attention, and it will purify your lives. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze wash basin with a bronze stand place it between the tabernacle and the altar, and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet there. They must wash with water whenever they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord and when they approach the altar to burn up their special gifts to the Lord, or they will die. They must always wash their hands and feet, or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants, to be observed from generation to generation. Then the Lord said to Moses, Collect choice spices, twelve and a half pounds of pure myrrh, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant calamus, and twelve and a half pounds of cassia, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. Also get one gallon of olive oil. Like a skilled incense maker, blend these ingredients to make a holy anointing oil. Use this sacred oil to anoint the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. The table and all its utensils, the lampstand and all its accessories, the incense altar. The altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the wash basin with its stand. Consecrate them to make them absolutely holy. After this, whatever touches them will also become holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons also, consecrating them to serve me as priests. And say to the people of Israel, This holy anointing oil is reserved for me from generation to generation. It must never be used to anoint anyone else, and you must never make any blend like it for yourselves. It is holy, and you must treat it as holy. Anyone who makes a blend like it or anoints someone other than a priest will be cut off from the community. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather fragrant spices, resin droplets, mollusk shell, and galbanum, and mix these fragrant spices with pure frankincense, weighed out in equal amounts. Using the usual techniques of the incense maker, blend the spices together and sprinkle them with salt to produce a pure and holy incense. Grind some of the mixture into a very fine powder and put it in front of the Ark of the Covenant, where I will meet with you in the tabernacle. You must treat this incense as most holy. 
never use this formula to make this incense for yourselves. It is reserved for the Lord, and you must treat it as holy. Anyone who makes incense like this for personal use will be cut off from the community. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel son of Uri, grandson of her, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And I have personally appointed Oholiab son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, to be his assistant. Moreover, I have given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. The Tabernacle The Ark of the Covenant The Ark's Cover, the Place of Atonement All the Furnishings of the Tabernacle The Table and its Utensils The Pure Gold Lampstand with all its Accessories The Incense Altar the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils. The wash basin with its stand. The beautifully stitched garments, the sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons to wear as they minister as priests. The anointing oil. The fragrant incense for the holy place, the craftsman must make everything as I have commanded you. The Lord then gave these instructions to Moses. Tell the people of Israel, Be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so you may know that I am the Lord, who makes you holy. You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death, anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on the Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he stopped working and was refreshed. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, written by the finger of God. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses, who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters, and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. The Lord told Moses, Quick! Go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, 
These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, Why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say, their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. And I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hands the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work, the words on them were written by God himself. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, It sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, No, it's not a shout of victory nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of a celebration. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get so upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses, who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Each of you, take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command, and about three thousand people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a terrible sin, but I will go back up to the Lord on the mountain. Perhaps I will be able to obtain forgiveness for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. 32 But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from the record you have written. 
But the Lord replied to Moses, No, I will erase the name of everyone who has sinned against me. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. Look! My angel will lead the way before you. And when I come to call the people to account, I will certainly hold them responsible for their sins. Then the Lord sent a great plague upon the people because they had worshipped the calf Aaron had made. The Lord said to Moses, Get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants. And I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. When the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothes. For the Lord had told Moses to tell them, You are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothes while I decide what to do with you. So from the time they left Mount Sinai, the Israelites wore no more jewelry or fine clothes. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand in the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. Afterward Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, Take these people up to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest, everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, Then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, Look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind. But my face will not be seen. Then the Lord told Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I will write on them the same words that were on the tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. 
no one else may come with you. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two tablets of stone like the first ones. Early in the morning he climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh. The Lord. The God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger. And filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshipped. And he said, O Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. The Lord replied, Listen, I am making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display for you. But listen carefully to everything I command you today. Then I will go ahead of you and drive out the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be very careful never to make a treaty with the people who live in the land where you are going. If you do, you will follow their evil ways and be trapped. Instead, you must break down their pagan altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles. You must worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. You must not make a treaty of any kind with the people living in the land. They lust after their gods, offering sacrifices to them. They will invite you to join them in their sacrificial meals, and you will go with them. Then you will accept their daughters, who sacrifice to other gods, as wives for your sons. And they will seduce your sons to commit adultery against me by worshipping other gods. You must not make any gods of molten metal for yourselves. You must celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in early spring, in the month of Abib, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. The firstborn of every animal belongs to me, including the firstborn males from your herds of cattle and your flocks of sheep and goats. A firstborn donkey may be bought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or young goat in its place. But if you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son, no one may appear before me without an offering. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working, even during the seasons of plowing and harvest. You must celebrate the festival of harvest with the first crop of the wheat harvest, and celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season. Three times each year every man in Israel must appear before the Sovereign, the Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out the other nations ahead of you and expand your territory, so no one will covet and conquer your land while you appear before the Lord your God three times each year. You must not offer the blood of my sacrificial offerings together with any baked goods containing yeast. 
and none of the meat of the Passover sacrifice may be kept over until the next morning. As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God, you must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down all these instructions, for they represent the terms of the covenant I am making with you and with Israel. Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord forty days and forty nights. In all that time he ate no bread and drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone tablets. When Moses came down Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them and asked Aaron and all the leaders of the community to come over, and he talked with them. Then all the people of Israel approached him, and Moses gave them all the instructions the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. But whenever he went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he would remove the veil until he came out again. Then he would give the people whatever instructions the Lord had given him. And the people of Israel would see the radiant glow of his face. So he would put the veil over his face until he returned to speak with the Lord. Then Moses called together the whole community of Israel and told them, These are the instructions the Lord has commanded you to follow. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on that day must be put to death. You must not even light a fire in any of your homes on the Sabbath. Then Moses said to the whole community of Israel, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair for cloth, tanned ram skins and fine goatskin leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. Come, all of you who are gifted craftsmen. Construct everything that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle and its sacred tent, its covering, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases. The ark and its carrying poles. The ark's cover, the place of atonement. The inner curtain to shield the ark. The table, its carrying poles, and all its utensils. The bread of the presence. For light, the lampstand, its accessories, the lamp cups, and the olive oil for lighting. The incense altar and its carrying poles. The anointing oil and fragrant incense. The curtain for the entrance of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering. The bronze grating of the altar and its carrying poles and utensils. The wash basin with its stand. The curtains for the walls of the courtyard. The posts and their bases. The curtain for the entrance to the courtyard. The tent pegs of the tabernacle and courtyard and their ropes. The beautifully stitched garments for the priests to wear while ministering in the holy place, the sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons to wear as they minister as priests. So the whole community of Israel left Moses and returned to their tents. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, 
all whose hearts were willing. They brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, brooches, earrings, rings from their fingers, and necklaces. They presented gold objects of every kind as a special offering to the Lord. All those who owned the following items willingly brought them, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat hair for cloth, and tanned ram skins and fine goatskin leather. And all who had silver and bronze objects gave them as a sacred offering to the Lord. And those who had acacia wood brought it for use in the project. All the women who were skilled in sewing and spinning prepared blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine linen cloth. All the women who were willing used their skills to spin the goat hair into yarn. The leaders brought onyx stones and the special gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light, the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense. So the people of Israel, every man and woman who was eager to help in the work the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. Then Moses told the people of Israel, The Lord has specifically chosen Bezalel son of Uri, grandson of her, of the tribe of Judah. The Lord has filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And the Lord has given both him and Oholiab son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach their skills to others. The Lord has given them special skills as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet thread on fine linen cloth, and weavers. They excel as craftsmen and as designers. The Lord has gifted Bezalel, Oholiab, and the other skilled craftsmen with wisdom and ability to perform any task involved in building the sanctuary. Let them construct and furnish the tabernacle, just as the Lord has commanded. So Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and all the others who were specially gifted by the Lord and were eager to get to work. Moses gave them the materials donated by the people of Israel as sacred offerings for the completion of the sanctuary. But the people continued to bring additional gifts each morning. Finally the craftsmen who were working on the sanctuary left their work. They went to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp, men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. The skilled craftsmen made ten curtains of finely woven linen for the tabernacle. Then Bezalel decorated the curtains with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. All ten curtains were exactly the same size, 42 feet long and 6 feet wide. Five of these curtains were joined together to make one long curtain, and the other five were joined to make a second long curtain. He made fifty loops of blue yarn and put them along the edge of the last curtain in each set. The fifty loops along the edge of one curtain matched the fifty loops along the edge of the other curtain. Then he made fifty gold clasps and fastened the long curtains together with the clasps. In this way, the tabernacle was made of one continuous piece. He made eleven curtains of goat hair cloth to serve as a tent covering for the tabernacle. These eleven curtains were all exactly the same size, forty-five feet long and six feet wide. Bezalel joined five of these curtains together to make one long curtain, and the other six were joined to make a second long curtain. 
He made fifty loops for the edge of each large curtain. He also made fifty bronze clasps to fasten the long curtains together. In this way, the tent covering was made of one continuous piece. He completed the tent covering with a layer of tanned ram skins and a layer of fine goatskin leather. For the framework of the tabernacle, Bezalel constructed frames of acacia wood. Each frame was 15 feet high and 27 inches wide. With two pegs under each frame. All the frames were identical. He made 20 of these frames to support the curtains on the south side of the tabernacle. He also made 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame, with the pegs fitting securely into the bases. For the north side of the tabernacle, he made another 20 frames. With their 40 silver bases, two bases under each frame. He made six frames for the rear, the west side of the tabernacle. Along with two additional frames to reinforce the rear corners of the tabernacle. These corner frames were matched at the bottom and firmly attached at the top with a single ring, forming a single corner unit. Both of these corner units were made the same way. So there were eight frames at the rear of the tabernacle, set in sixteen silver bases, two bases under each frame. Then he made crossbars of acacia wood to link the frames, five crossbars for the north side of the tabernacle, and five for the south side. He also made five crossbars for the rear of the tabernacle, which faced west. He made the middle crossbar to attach halfway up the frames, it ran all the way from one end of the tabernacle to the other. He overlaid the frames with gold and made gold rings to hold the crossbars. Then he overlaid the crossbars with gold as well. For the inside of the tabernacle, Bezalel made a special curtain of finely woven linen. He decorated it with blue, purple, and scarlet thread and with skillfully embroidered cherubim. For the curtain, he made four posts of acacia wood and four gold hooks. He overlaid the posts with gold and set them in four silver bases. Then he made another curtain for the entrance to the sacred tent. He made it of finely woven linen and embroidered it with exquisite designs using blue, purple, and scarlet thread. This curtain was hung on gold hooks attached to five posts. The posts with their decorated tops and hooks were overlaid with gold, and the five bases were cast from bronze. Next Bezalel made the Ark of Acacia wood, a sacred chest 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. He overlaid it inside and outside with pure gold, and he ran a molding of gold all around it. He cast four gold rings and attached them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Then he made poles from acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He inserted the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. Then he made the ark's cover, the place of atonement, from pure gold. It was 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. He made two cherubim from hammered gold and placed them on the two ends of the atonement cover. He molded the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all of one piece of gold. The cherubim faced each other and looked down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they protected it. Then Bezalel made the table of acacia wood, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. He overlaid it with pure gold and ran a gold molding around the edge. He decorated it with a 3-inch border all around, and he ran a gold molding along the border. Then he cast four gold rings for the table and attached them at the four corners next to the four legs. The rings were attached near the border to hold the poles that were used to carry the table. He made these poles from acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. 
Then he made special containers of pure gold for the table, bowls, ladles, jars, and pitchers, to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. Then Bezalel made the lampstand of pure, hammered gold. He made the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece, the base, center stem, lamp cups, buds, and petals. The lampstand had six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. Each of the six branches had three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. The center stem of the lampstand was crafted with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. There was an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extended from the center stem, all made of one piece. The almond buds and branches were all of one piece with the center stem, and they were hammered from pure gold. He also made seven lamps for the lampstand, lamp snuffers, and trays, all of pure gold. The entire lampstand, along with its accessories, was made from 75 pounds of pure gold. Then Bezalel made the incense altar of acacia wood. It was 18 inches square and 36 inches high, with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar itself. He overlaid the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold, and he ran a gold molding around the entire altar. He made two gold rings and attached them on opposite sides of the altar below the gold molding to hold the carrying poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. Then he made the sacred anointing oil and the fragrant incense, using the techniques of a skilled incense maker. Next Bezalel used acacia wood to construct the square altar of burnt offering. It was seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. He made horns for each of its four corners so that the horns and altar were all one piece. He overlaid the altar with bronze. Then he made all the altar utensils of bronze, the ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat forks, and fire pans. Next he made a bronze grating and installed it halfway down the side of the altar, under the ledge. He cast four rings and attached them to the corners of the bronze grating to hold the carrying poles. He made the poles from acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He inserted the poles through the rings on the sides of the altar. The altar was hollow and was made from planks. Bezalel made the bronze wash basin and its bronze stand from bronze mirrors donated by the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then Bezalel made the courtyard, which was enclosed with curtains made of finely woven linen. On the south side the curtains were 150 feet long. They were held up by 20 posts set securely in 20 bronze bases. He hung the curtains with silver hooks and rings. He made a similar set of curtains for the north side, 150 feet of curtains held up by 20 posts set securely in bronze bases. He hung the curtains with silver hooks and rings. The curtains on the west end of the courtyard were 75 feet long, hung with silver hooks and rings and supported by 10 posts set into 10 bases. The east end, the front, was also 75 feet long. The courtyard entrance was on the east end, flanked by two curtains. The curtain on the right side was 22 and a half feet long and was supported by three posts set into three bases. The curtain on the left side was also 22 and a half feet long and was supported by three posts set into three bases. All the curtains used in the courtyard were made of finely woven linen. Each post had a bronze base, and all the hooks and rings were silver. The tops of the posts of the courtyard were overlaid with silver, and the rings to hold up the curtains were made of silver. He made the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard of finely woven linen, 
and he decorated it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet thread. It was thirty feet long, and its height was seven and a half feet, just like the curtains of the courtyard walls. It was supported by four posts, each set securely in its own bronze base. The tops of the posts were overlaid with silver, and the hooks and rings were also made of silver. All the tent pegs used in the tabernacle and courtyard were made of bronze. This is an inventory of the materials used in building the Tabernacle of the Covenant. The Levites compiled the figures, as Moses directed, and Ithamar son of Aaron the priest served as recorder. Bezalel son of Uri, grandson of her, of the tribe of Judah, made everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He was assisted by Oholiab son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, a craftsman expert at engraving, designing, and embroidering with blue, purple, and scarlet thread on fine linen cloth. The people brought special offerings of gold totaling 2,193 pounds, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. This gold was used throughout the tabernacle. The whole community of Israel gave 7,545 pounds of silver, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. This silver came from the tax collected from each man registered in the census. The tax is one bika, which is half a shekel, based on the sanctuary shekel. The tax was collected from 603,550 men who had reached their 20th birthday. The hundred bases for the frames of the sanctuary walls and for the posts supporting the inner curtain required 7,500 pounds of silver, about 75 pounds for each base. The remaining 45 pounds of silver was used to make the hooks and rings and to overlay the tops of the posts. The people also brought as special offerings 5,310 pounds of bronze which was used for casting the bases for the posts at the entrance to the tabernacle, and for the bronze altar with its bronze grating and all the altar utensils. Bronze was also used to make the bases for the posts that supported the curtains around the courtyard, the bases for the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard, and all the tent pegs for the tabernacle and the courtyard. The craftsmen made beautiful sacred garments of blue, purple, and scarlet cloth, clothing for Aaron to wear while ministering in the holy place, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Bezalel made the ephod of finely woven linen and embroidered it with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. He made gold thread by hammering out thin sheets of gold and cutting it into fine strands. With great skill and care, he worked it into the fine linen with the blue, purple, and scarlet thread. The ephod consisted of two pieces, front and back, joined at the shoulders with two shoulder pieces. The decorative sash was made of the same materials, finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They mounted the two onyx stones in settings of gold filigree. The stones were engraved with the names of the tribes of Israel, just as a seal is engraved. He fastened these stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as a reminder that the priest represents the people of Israel. All this was done just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Bezalel made the chest piece with great skill and care. He made it to match the ephod, using finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. He made the chest piece of a single piece of cloth folded to form a pouch nine inches square. They mounted four rows of gemstones on it. The first row contained a red carnelian, a pale green peridot, and an emerald. The second row contained a turquoise, a blue lapis lazuli, and a white moonstone. The third row contained an orange jacinth, an agate, and a purple amethyst. The fourth row contained a blue-green beryl, an onyx, and a green jasper. All these stones were set in gold filigree. Each stone represented one of the twelve sons of Israel, and the name of that tribe was engraved on it like a seal. To attach the chest piece to the ephod, 
they made braided cords of pure gold thread. They also made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings and attached them to the top corners of the chest piece. They tied the two gold cords to the rings on the chest piece. They tied the other ends of the cords to the gold settings on the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two more gold rings and attached them to the inside edges of the chest piece next to the ephod. Then they made two more gold rings and attached them to the front of the ephod, below the shoulder pieces, just above the knot where the decorative sash was fastened to the ephod. They attached the bottom rings of the chest piece to the rings on the ephod with blue cords. In this way, the chest piece was held securely to the ephod above the decorative sash. All this was done just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Bezalel made the robe that is worn with the ephod from a single piece of blue woven cloth. With an opening for Aaron's head in the middle of it. The opening was reinforced with a woven collar so it would not tear. They made pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and attached them to the hem of the robe. They also made bells of pure gold and placed them between the pomegranates along the hem of the robe. With bells and pomegranates alternating all around the hem. This robe was to be worn whenever the priest ministered before the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made tunics for Aaron and his sons from fine linen cloth. The turban and the special head coverings were made of fine linen, and the undergarments were also made of finely woven linen. The sashes were made of finely woven linen and embroidered with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Finally, they made the sacred medallion, the badge of holiness, of pure gold. They engraved it like a seal with these words, Holy to the Lord. They attached the medallion with a blue cord to Aaron's turban, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so at last the tabernacle was finished. The Israelites had done everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they brought the entire tabernacle to Moses, the sacred tent with all its furnishings, clasps, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases. The tent coverings of tanned ram skins and fine goatskin leather. The inner curtain to shield the ark. The ark of the covenant and its carrying poles. The ark's cover, the place of atonement the table and all its utensils, the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its symmetrical lamp cups, all its accessories, and the olive oil for lighting, the gold altar, the anointing oil and fragrant incense, the curtain for the entrance of the sacred tent, the bronze altar, the bronze grating and its carrying poles and utensils, the wash basin with its stand, the curtains for the walls of the courtyard, the posts and their bases, the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the ropes and tent pegs, all the furnishings to be used in worship at the tabernacle, the beautifully stitched garments for the priests to wear while ministering in the holy place, the sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons to wear as they minister as priests. So the people of Israel followed all of the Lord's instructions to Moses. Then Moses inspected all their work. When he found it had been done just as the Lord had commanded him, he blessed them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the Ark of the Covenant inside, and install the inner curtain to enclose the Ark within the most holy place. Then bring in the table, and arrange the utensils on it. And bring in the lampstand, and set up the lamps. Place the gold incense altar in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Then hang the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the tabernacle entrance. Set the wash basin between the tabernacle and the altar and fill it with water. Then set up the courtyard around the outside of the tent, and hang the curtain for the courtyard entrance. 
Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all its furnishings to consecrate them and make them holy. Anoint the altar of burnt offering and its utensils to consecrate them. Then the altar will become absolutely holy. Next anoint the wash basin and its stand to consecrate them. Present Aaron and his sons at the entrance of the tabernacle, and wash them with water. Dress Aaron with the sacred garments and anoint him, consecrating him to serve me as a priest. Then present his sons and dress them in their tunics. Anoint them as you did their father, so they may also serve me as priests. With their anointing, Aaron's descendants are set apart for the priesthood forever, from generation to generation. Moses proceeded to do everything just as the Lord had commanded him. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month of the second year. Moses erected the tabernacle by setting down its bases, inserting the frames, attaching the crossbars, and setting up the posts. Then he spread the coverings over the tabernacle framework and put on the protective layers, just as the Lord had commanded him. He took the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant and placed them inside the Arkansas. Then he attached the carrying poles to the ark, and he set the ark's cover, the place of atonement, on top of it. Then he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle and hung the inner curtain to shield it from view, just as the Lord had commanded him. Next Moses placed the table in the tabernacle, along the north side of the holy place, just outside the inner curtain. And he arranged the bread of the presence on the table before the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded him. He set the lampstand in the tabernacle across from the table on the south side of the holy place. Then he lit the lamps in the Lord's presence, just as the Lord had commanded him. He also placed the gold incense altar in the tabernacle, in the holy place in front of the inner curtain. On it he burned the fragrant incense, just as the Lord had commanded him. He hung the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. And he placed the altar of burnt offering near the tabernacle entrance. On it he offered a burnt offering and a grain offering, just as the Lord had commanded him. Next Moses placed the wash basin between the tabernacle and the altar. He filled it with water so the priests could wash themselves. Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons used water from it to wash their hands and feet. Whenever they approached the altar and entered the tabernacle, they washed themselves, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he hung the curtains forming the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar. And he set up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. So at last Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey, following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys.